Hello, uh, very good morning. Good afternoon or good evening, depending on from where you are joining us today. Thank you all for joining us for yet another awesome session. Uh, I'm Kile, your host for today's session. I'm the first homegrown GP and a fellow in med uh, palliative medicine from Bhutan. I'm also the uh, Aspire Lesson for South Asia Wonka since 2021. I begin with uh, this quote. I quote, become a type of leader that people would follow voluntarily, even if you have no title or position, unquote, Brent Casey. Welcome to the second physician leadership webinar. The topic for today is effective leadership practices brought to you by Aspire Global Project, started by the Wonka Young Doctors Movement. We have Young Doctors Movement lead, Dr. Sanka, and the Global Aspire lead, Dr. Uma, and also um, Aspire Listen for Europe, doc, uh, Dr. Maria in the steering team. I'm so delighted to have all the health professionals gathered here. To begin with, let me share a very small story about myself. Some seven to eight years ago, when I was sent to a far-flung hospital in Bhutan right after my MBBS degree, I was barely 25 years old, just out of my medical school. But by default, I was to hit this hospital to manage about 20 bedded hospital with some hundred hospital staff. Some were there serving this hospital more than my age. And there was so much on my plate, which I, which I was never taught at my medical school. The administration, managing staff, taking leave, going for training, workshop, the infrastructure, maintenance, procurement, et cetera, et cetera. So many apart from a patient management. However, I somehow made it today but I wish I had some skills to manage those times well. So physician leadership is a crucial aspect of a doctor's career, but we all recognize that it is not typically emphasized or formally taught in our medical schools. But as the physicians progress in their career, they often find themselves in the leadership roles, whether as a department head, team leaders, or administrators. Effective leadership becomes essential after driving positive change, improving patient outcomes, and fostering a collaborative healthcare environment. Physicians often learn leadership skills through on-job experiences, mentorships, self-directed learning, or real-life challenges and experiences that provide valuable opportunities for them to develop leadership qualities, such as communication, decision-making, and ability to inspire and motivate teams. The significance of a strong leadership cannot be stressed in this constantly changing world of healthcare. In determining the future of medicine, doctors who are the foundation of healthcare will be crucial. We are here today to discuss and celebrate the art and the science of the physician leadership, a path that comes with its own set of difficulties and immeasurable benefits with our topic for today is effective leadership practice. Our goal is to create a network of leaders devoted to enhancing patient care, encouraging innovation, and bringing about good change in the healthcare sector. In the, in the upcoming hour, we will hear from expertise and ex speakers, their insightful discussions and knowledge sharing that will help each one of us enhance in our leadership development. This webinar will not only cover theory, but will also have a useful advisor from our leaders, which you may find it useful in our day-to-day -day work. As I mentioned earlier, physician leadership is not without its challenges. As Sir Winston Churchill amply put it, I quote, courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen, unquote. Effective leaders must have a courage to embrace change and to learn from their peers and patients and to collaborate with diverse teams and all while keeping the patient's best interest at the forefront. But also keep in mind that leadership is a never ending journey, not a destination. There are always opportunities to grow as a leader, whether you have experience or you are just starting to explore your potential. I quote, leadership in medicine is not a title, it's a commitment to inspire, influence and instill hope in the lives of the people we serve, unquote. So let's embark on this journey together. Let's harness the collaborative wisdom in this virtual room to inspire and support each other in becoming the physician leader our health 
care system desperately need. With this, let me introduce you our distinguished speakers today. First speaker for today is Ms. Isra Khan. Ms. Isra Khan is a professional coach and organizational development leader who partners with leaders, teams, and companies to make the right thing easier to do. She is a natural connector and she's about, and you are about to witness that she has a gift of helping uncover our true vibrancy. Isra has experience of 15 years guiding leaders to drive high performance and transformational change. She spent seven years in Moffitt Cancer Center, developing leaders at all levels, and especially passionate about creating programs that develop clinical leaders. Isra currently serves as a director of organizational development at Yuma Regional Health uh, Medical Center in Yuma, Arizona, USA. Her portfolio, portfolio has expanded to include coaching and facilitation for the Family Medicine Resident Program, as well as medical directors across the, the hospital. Is a whole bachelor's degree in psychology and business from the University of uh, Minnesota, Twin City, and a master's degree in industrial organizational psychology from Chicago School of Professional Psychology. That's for Ms. Isra Khan. Our second speaker for today's session is Dr. Bisan Iraka. She's a young family, medicine, family physician with an interest in public health and epidemiology, master's degree in epidemiology and public health, both certifi uh, certification in family medicine from Palestine Medical Council and family medicine from N. Nija Medical University in 2020. Recently, she received a diploma in safety, quality, informatics, and leadership from Harvard University in the United States. She is also a member of World Organization for Family Medicine, Wonka, and I, Zari Waidi, and Lathan from Palestine. Dr. Marika has a special interest in research, and she has published over more than 23 research papers with a high quotation, citation score, and a peer review. Her research on COVID earned her a number of research honors, including the Best Palestinian Research Award for the two consecutive years, 2022 and 2023, and the Best Oral Presentation for Wonka Bissell Early Healthcare Research. Now, to uh, just to introduce my our third uh, speaker for the, for the session, Dr. Natalia Galarza was born in Durango, Mexico, and grew up near Yuma, Arizona. Inspiring her interest in becoming a doctor was her mother, who was also a family physician in Mexico and has, a practice, has, a practice, has practiced family medicine for over 25 years now. Dr. Galarza attended medical school at University Autonoma at Baja California, located in Mexicali, Baja California. She graduated with honors. She completed her family medicine at uh, Yuma Regional Medical Center, where she's also a part of the first graduating class. Dr. Galarza had worked on both sides of international borders as a physician, which gives her the first-hand understanding of a region's unique healthcare challenges. Her passion for global health, medicine, advocacy, and medicinal education. She finished two academic uh, fellowships, one with the University of Arizona College Medicine and finished for faculty development and emergent leaders fellowship with the Society of Teachers for Family Medicine. This year, she is a part of the new scholars for the Society of Teaching Family Medicine. Dr. Garazo started a mentorship program for underserved students in Yuma country two years ago. She believes in family medicine as a whole and loves the bonds that speciality allows physicians to have their patients. She is now the core at the Yuma core faculty at the Yuma Regional Medical Center Family Medicine Program for last six years. Earlier this year she further evolved her purpose of improving the health of the community and advancing health Family Medicine Outreach by accepting a new position to become the program director for the new residency program in the south of Yuma country. Other professional memberships is that she's a member of the American Academy for Family Medicine, Arizona Academy for Family Medicine, and National Hispanic Medical Association. 
guest for Dr. Galarza. And we also have a special guest for tonight's session, Dr. Raman Kumar, the National President for Academy of Family Physicians of India and the past President of Wonka South Asia 2018 to 2021. Dr. Raman was also the first young doctor elect for South Asia. Dr. Raman was recently featured on the cover of the Lancet as a global primary healthcare leader, one of the first generation residents trained both qualified family physicians. He holds a long standing interest in making contribution to primary care. He is a founding of the president for Academy of Family Physicians for India, an organization that is chairheading the movement of the return of trusted family doctors tradition in India. Dr. Raman is also editor-in-chief of Family Medicine and Primary Care, a peer-reviewed PubMed Index journal. He had been conferred several rewards and recognition to name few Healthcare Leadership Award 2012 India, Montego to Global Scholar Award 2023, and Delhi Healthcare uh, Award in Dhaka 2020. He also successfully uh, conducted the 15th World Rural Health Conference in New Delhi. This conference successfully accumulated the adoption of the Delhi Declaration 2018, which calls for people living in the rural and isolated parts of the world be given special priority if nation is to achieve universal health coverage. The health declaration endorsed by WHO represented the Alma Atta Declaration with the aim to achieve the highest possible level of health for communities we serve with the global goal of health for all rural people. Dr. Rahman is a true leader, inspiring many young doctors worldwide. Thank you so much for your presence tonight, sir. And before I hand over to Ezra, some housekeeping notes. Kindly fill out our questionnaires if you haven't. Yeah, over to you, Ezra. Thank you so much, Kinley, for the kind introductions and uh, for those beautiful quotes. I, um, I'm a fan of that Winston Churchill quote quite a bit on courage and leadership. Leadership is what it takes to, to um, stand up and leadership is also what it takes to sit down and listen. So um, with that, I want to welcome everybody to part two of this uh, leadership development webinar series, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, today we're gonna be talking about effective leadership practices. So if you had joined us for um, last month, our part one, which was introduction to physician leadership, um, I hope that you remember some of the, some of the uh, cornerstones of leadership that we discussed. But if you don't, and that's okay, and if you're joining us for the first time, welcome. Um, a very, very heartfelt welcome to everybody that's that's here with us, whether for the first time or coming back. So a quick recap of part one, and this is going to help us sort of set the stage for this webinar as we move along. So the, the recap is this visual. Emotional intelligence is the cornerstone of leadership. Um, leadership, as Kinley mentioned earlier, is really begins early in a physician's career, um, sometimes before we even notice it. And emotional intelligence and its components are the cornerstone of effective leadership. So we talked about emotional intelligence being being aware of yourself, right? Paying attention to where you are, uh, being aware of others. So that's social awareness, picking up on cues from your team, from your patients, et cetera. Managing yourself. So when things aren't going according to plan or if you're rushed or if you're stressed, you have to be able to understand that, number one, and then also manage that so that your, um, your sense of calm and your sense of focus remains intact. And then the fourth one is relationship management. So how do you manage relationships well instead of assuming that everything is just going to work out, right? If, if you avoid an issue, maybe it, it's not there. Um, so this is the, some of the things that we talked about last time um, as it relates to uh, the fundamentals of leadership development. So um, today we're gonna be talking about this movement. So emotional intelligence is really the foundation. So now as a physician leader, 
how do you kind of translate your practicing of emotional intelligence into effective leadership practices? So that's kind of what our uh, um, time is like for uh, today. So we're going to be talking about um, a few different things as it relates to the um, relationships of um, your team, uh, communicating effectively, collaborating effectively, and decision-making skills. How do you make effective decisions, um, not only for your patients, but also for the teams to which you belong and for the teams to that, that you lead? So I want to start, start us off with a very quick interactive exercise. So I would like for every one of you, if you're able, uh, to please find a blank piece of paper and something to write with, or it's a pen, pencil, doesn't matter. Um, so if you'd indulge me, just a really quick exercise. Um, so if everyone has access to a blank piece of paper, it doesn't have to be large. And I'm going to ask you to think about two things, okay? So this exercise, I would like for you not to use words. I would like for you to use imagery and visuals. I would like for you on the first side of your paper to draw yourself depicted in your own, what do you think is your own leadership style? How do you see yourself as a leader? How do you come across as a leader? And draw that out. No words, don't write words. Just draw a picture really quickly. And then the second part is no, turn no, the paper no, no, no. over. I could, um, could we have everyone just muted, please, if we're not um, speaking? That would be great. Thank you. The second part of, the, of this exercise is you turn the paper over and you think about a leader in your career. It doesn't matter when. Draw the depiction of a leader that you least enjoyed working with. So just to recap, the first side is yourself, dominant, your default leadership style. The other side is a leader that you least enjoyed working with. What, what was that like? So I'm going to give you really quick, maybe like a minute uh, to kind of be creative. You are welcome to share your picture, although it's not required. I will be asking you to share what is on your picture. Um, Please be creative. This is a very um, creative exercise and we will debrief in one minute. Okay, so I am curious, um, and would anybody like to share, just feel free to unmute yourself if you're on video, that's great. Any brave souls want to share what they um, drew out as their dominant leadership style? What is on your picture? Um, yes, um, Srikala Ravi Shankar. Please yeah, go ahead. Hi. Thank you. Yeah, so I just grabbed my cell phone and I'm just going to show you the picture what I drew on my notes. Okay, sure. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, so tell me what's going on. What What is this? All right. So um, this, as a leader myself, uh, so you asked two questions, right? One is how you depict yourself as a leader and how... Uh, least enjoyed working with 
yes. so to answer the first one my leadership style is a mixed style depending on what kind of situation i encounter but it's mostly oh. empathetic because okay. i mean one style it doesn't suit all so it's definitely a mixed mm-hmm. style and excellent I, i least enjoyed working with most of them because i think the pride is in the title and not the work or how they help mm. others thank you so much for sharing that i love that you uh, shared that uh, leadership is not a one size fits all that is exactly what we're going to be talking about is how do you flex your style so that you can adapt to the situation that's very good okay i want to hear from one more and please members of the project team uh please um also share you did this before when we were preparing so you you're welcome to share as well anyone anyone um bruni dorset please unmute yourself hi everybody so hey. for my drawing that depicts myself and my favorite leadership style i have here let me see if i could focus it no it's going to blur but anyway it's supposed to show what's oh, going on on social right it's supposed to really be depicting and by the way one minute is not enough time to to draw it <laughs> itself um, but yeah supposed to be depicting um me basically this is supposed to so i have like basically glitter sparkles stars hearts beautiful coming out of my mouth as i speak to <laughs> a very unmotivated team member uh-huh. Um, Excellent. so my favorite style would probably be one of motivation as well as transformation. Um, and then it's a little arrow to show that after my little, um, you know, my inspiration and motivation and transformation on them, they are transformed to being on some sort of highest peak of a uh, platform for whatever it is that they were working on. And they're saying, you know, that I could do it. So not necessarily, trying to put the focus on myself but just um empowering my team Beautiful. uplifting them to be transformed i did not have enough time for the second part so right now i just have a start of a stick figure with some irritated little squiggles okay. above the head so that would be probably a manager more than i would say a leader who um is more dictator telling me what to do there's no room for creativity it's uh, mm-hmm. more of a fair based way of mm-hmm. running things sort of mm-hmm. things so, mm-hmm. yeah, thank you excellent thank you so much for sharing that you know i i've done this for a while um with different teams and almost always right the the leadership style that we say that we are um you know that that we pride ourselves in are like you know the 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 empathetic the helping people i you know members of our project team when we did this exercise together they said we're all having a meal together we are all breaking bread together we're collaborative we're not isolated you know things of that nature and then the flip side is micromanager right someone drew a dinosaur i think you know someone drew a dragon um all that types of stuff so so i want you to really pay attention this um exercise is really to help you understand that you do have a default leadership style whether you know it or not okay and you do uh pay attention and you have an idea of what a leadership style is that you don't enjoy you already know that uh as depicted in in your artwork essentially so we're going to come back to that but what i want to quickly say is our objectives for this webinar is to understand how to flex your style depending on the situation increase your awareness of the team dynamics that are going on remember this is part of emotional intelligence right the social awareness and number 3 we are really going to just barely scratch the surface on the basics of conflict resolution because no matter our intention there is going to be times where we don't see eye to eye and we have to resolve conflict very quickly 
or else it is going to impact our clinical outcomes. So in order to set the stage for that and how you know, teamwork impacts clinical outcomes, I'm actually gonna turn it over to the queen of, of research herself. Um, Bisan is going to walk us through a summary of some of the literature that she's found. Um, so Bisa, I'm gonna turn it over to you if you are. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Lovely, here you go. Uh, so according to the General Medical Council, uh, being a good doctor means more than simply being a good clinician. Um, and according to the General Medical Council, doctors in their day-to-day -day role can provide leadership to their colleagues and vision for the organization for which they work and for the profession as a whole. Uh, on a quick review of literature, we found an editorial entitled Teamwork in Family Medicine, Another Myth to Expose. In the paper, they describe teamwork in family medicine as a scare term. They argue that even though there is evidence of improved health outcomes and higher patient satisfaction associated with team-based care, and that there appears to be a relationship between teamwork in family medicine and patient safety, that teamwork may also be one of the solutions to prevent, di and diagnose, and treat professional uh, burnout uh, in addition, an external evaluation of primary healthcare reform in Portugal identified teamwork as a key of success of the reform. However, some evidence suggests that teamwork is the enemy of continuity of care. Since bigger teams have lower continuity and when everyone is responsible, there is no one is responsible. So also there is also evidence of uh, that medical errors often creep in during handovers of patients from one team member to another. Another challenge to teamwork comes from turf wars, battles between professionals, groups for the, on the ownership of procedure, the type of patient, uh, body of knowledge, all of these tend to work against the goal of teamwork and against the interest of the patient, of course. Back to you, Isra. Sorry, I had to find the unmute button. Thank you so much, uh, Bison. So, so this really is the cornerstone here because we looked at the literature, and this is important to share because, you know, the literature all share is is fairly supportive with the fact of, you know, effective clinical teams yield better outcomes. You know, there's a lot of literature on that. But what Bison is also saying, and what and and what she's found as well is we need to also understand that teamwork also has it as its limits because there's certain things that, you know, teamwork is probably not a good idea. For example, in terms of crisis, acute situations, uh, critical care moments, things of that nature. That's where a leader needs to discern when, when teamwork is the most critical, okay? Because when we rely heavily on teamwork as the solution to all of our problems, it will impact continuity of care. It will create team divisions or what we call silos, right? All different teams are, are trying to work together, but they're too caught up in their own priorities to really pull up and, and look outwards. And there's also this whole piece of territory, right? Don't, don't encroach on my, my turf. This is my expertise. You stay there, right? So it gets it it gets prickly. So we wanted to be realistic with with how we're looking at teamwork, and really acknowledge the fact that teamwork has its limits and it also has its place. But that doesn't mean that we should not have it as a absolutely um, laser focused outcome. Because for the most part, clinical teams that have very good teamwork yield better outcomes. They are willing to speak up more when there's an issue, but you have to understand when teamwork is critical. And that is when we're going to go into our situational leadership model. So I'm going to be really running through some very, very important um, uh, models and concepts that quite frankly, within themselves will take a whole day to do a workshop. So I'm doing this really quickly. And just to give you an exposure 
uh, to this and to kind of get your mind jogging so that you can, in your own time, look at this further, or, you know, talk to your mentors, talk to your guides, um, read things, or sort of start developing yourself as a leader, uh, using this as sort of like a starting point, okay? So when we talk about situational leadership, this goes back to the earlier point that was just made, um, where the different situation will demand a different leadership leadership style for you. Now, how do you do that? The first thing you have to understand is that you can have more than one style. In fact, you should have more than one style of leadership. And that all depends on the development stage of the team uh, or, or the, the each person on your team that should correspond with your style. So this is an actual model that has been validated by empirical research in psychology. So situational leadership is comprised of two different models. The first sort of half is to look at where is your, is your team at, right? Who are the members on your team, number one? Who is really on your team? Number two, what is the development level of them? So we started D1 right here, okay? So this is D1, where they're not fully developed yet, they're still developing. D1 means that they don't have a lot of the skills yet, they're probably new, but they have a very high level of commitment. So a lot of potential, a lot of speed of learning. So I would call D1 as enthusiastic beginners. They're very enthusiastic, but they're still in the beginning stages. So they're gonna require a different level of support from you as a leader compared to, let's say someone in D4. D4 are individuals that have a lot of expertise, very high commitment, and very high competence. These are the people that have a lot of expertise. So you want to lead them differently than how you would lead someone, let's say in a D1 uh, category. Now D2 and D3 are also in the middle and those are gonna correspond to your leadership style as well. So let's go into the actual leadership style uh, model. So based off of the development stages of your team, you're going to look at it in this way. Now, feel free to take a snapshot of this, a screenshot of this. This is really important. You can also Google situational leadership and this will, this will pop up for you. So for example, your leadership style is going to need to be a delicate balance between how much you direct behavior, so you're more directive, versus how much you support people. So that's supportive behavior. Directive behavior is telling people what to do. Supportive, be supportive behavior is partnering with them and dialoguing with them and asking them, what do you think you should do, okay? So based off of that, someone in a D1 development zone will require you to have an S1 development leadership style. That means you are more directive, okay? So you need to provide some direction to people in the D1 category. Now, someone in D4, they don't require a lot of direction, right? So using an S1, right, on this bottom right-hand corner here, using an S1 style is not going to work for your D4. They're going to feel micromanaged. They're going to feel like, you know, the picture that you drew on the other side of your paper. So instead of S1, you're probably going to need more delegating, right? So someone in D4, high competence, high commitment, they're going to need you to help them grow, right? So don't really direct them, delegate to them and tell them, I'm here if you need me, okay? So those are the two sides. So let's say you are in the directing category and you start noticing that someone that is new, your enthusiastic beginner is about to, is improving. So they don't need too much direction anymore, but they're not ready for delegating yet. So this is where you need to provide a mix of coaching 
and supportive behavior. Coaching is basically helping your team member to understand solutions to their own problems. So you're not directing them with, here is what you need to do. Coaching is to help them understand what they need to do by pro helping them problem solve on their own. What do you think you should do? What's the plan? What are the possibilities, et cetera, okay? So I'm going to pause right now because this is a large chunk of, of the webinar. I wanted to ask if anyone has any questions, any anyone in the chat or from the project team. Okay. It's like excellent. Like Looks like this. So that means I'm doing a good job. Okay, excellent. <laughs> All right. I will assume that. Lovely. Okay. If anything comes up in the middle, please feel free to um, write it down in the chat. We'll try and, and come to it afterwards. So this is situational leadership. How do you adjust your style based off of the development needs of your team? Okay. So this is how uh, you can move forward with that. Okay. So next thing is the team stuff, okay? So this is leading a team. Now you have to be aware of how do you lead and belong to a team? So when we go into this, I wanna kind of really draw a picture for you, okay? So for, forgive my mouse, if it's a little wonky, I'm not gonna draw um, straight lines, but we have to accept that the quality of our relationships right, as physicians, directly impact our outcomes. So for example, I'm gonna draw a really, really quick graph here. So on the x-axis is the quality of your relationships, right? So are they good, are they medium, are they, are they not so good? And the y-axis is the degree to which you meet your performance goals. So what that is patient, patient experience, um, clinical indicators, patient outcomes, what have you. So you need to understand that if you have a low, right, a low quality of relationship or, or a, a bad interaction with a team member, that is automatically going to impact the clinical outcome, okay? And that is known as contention, all right? If you're in a contentious relationship, you're automatically not going to really yield um, a good clinical outcome, okay? Now, let's just say that you put some work in to your relationships. You, you are practicing emotional intelligence and you're trying really hard to um, sort of smooth out a relationship between a colleague or a team member. Um, and so you get to another mode on this graph. So you make some changes, right? So you're, you're improving here. So you get to this different mode and you're not no longer in contention, but now you're just coexisting, okay? You're not in contention, but you're just coexisting, okay? So the, the your clinical outcomes will increase, but you're just coexisting, okay? Now, if you put in more effort, right, in into your quality of your relationships, then your clinical outcomes will increase a little bit, but not by that much, okay? This is where you'll reach a stage of cooperation. So contention, coexistence, cooperation. If you put just a little bit more effort into your quality of relationships, you'll jump up exponentially and you'll reach a phase called collaboration, okay? So one thing to just keep in mind is you will travel up and down this curve every single day, every single hour, okay? It depends on if you've had your coffee, it depends on the traffic, it depends on your patient load, it depends on a lot of things. But just remember that no one wants to be in contention, okay? It feels better to be in coexistence, but really what the goal is, 
is to get into cooperation or collaboration. And that means that we need to put some effort into our quality of our relationships so that we can yield the highest level of outcome for our patients and the communities that we serve. So to highlight an example of this, I want to ask Dr. Um, Natalia Galarza uh, to share a quick example of how this sort of plays out in the real world uh, with, with an example that she'd like to share. Natalia, please go ahead. Natalia, you're muted. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, so I actually have two examples. One Israel already knows, but as she was actually talking, it just, you know, a light bulb hit me. And the first one is, um, you know, early in my career, I have a, I had a very contagious relationship with um, a senior attending. Um, I would say that we were just, and, and we would knew, we would give ourselves the good morning, uh, but then that was about it. And one time, one of her patients um, came to clinic with me since she was um, out of town. And um, there was a critical diagnosis. Um, the patient had become a diabetic, um, a very uncontrolled diabetic suddenly. And I remember that I really struggled with myself to communicate with the other attending, with the other doctor. Um, I knew that just as professional courtesy and, you know, as colleagues in the same clinic, I needed to talk to her like, you know, normally I would have been like, hey, one of your patients in by my clinic last week, well, you were not here. She actually debuted as diabetic. She's in bad shape. I started her on medication and she's coming to see you um, next week or in a few weeks to see how the treatment's going. That's what I would have normally done if um, I would have had a good relationship with that physician. But I debated a lot to actually do that. I even really thought about keeping the patient to myself uh, just because I didn't even want to come. I didn't even want to talk to this other person. Um, and, you know, after talking about this, I, I came to understand that, yes, it was just because of the animosity that we had, but also of the, I didn't even want her to question me, like why I had decided to put her on a certain medication instead of something else. Um, it came from insecurity, but also from just a lot of mixed feelings. Um, but at the end, you know, I put my big girls, uh, big girl pants on and I'm, I went to her office and I'm like, hey, just for you to know, one of your patients came. I saw her X day. She's coming to see you again. And I started her on the medication. If you want details, there's my note. I actually made a purpose of writing a very detailed note. And um, that's, you know, you will find it. If you need anything, let me know. And that's it. Um, but I think it, it would have impacted. She had been the, piece, the primary physician for that patient for more than 10 years. Um, so the relationship would have obviously been impacted. And at the end, I think she she appreciated. I, I I know that she appreciated the the gesture in some way, and I think it was more civilized after that the relationship, or at least more courteous. Um, that was one. And then the other one that I was thinking of, it was actually when we have new residents or senior residents, you know, that end of the spectrum when we have interns, and um depending on the relationship that you have or even with any resident, any stage, um, I often tell the residents, like, you guys just have to adapt to four or five of us as your preceptors when we have to adapt like 18 of you. Um, and the residents will pick and choose who to, you know, precept their patients with. And unfortunately, that can have deep impact for the for the patient if they choose to precept that patient with a preceptor that 
you know, pays less attention to details or is doing something else, what is precepting, sometimes the bulk, um, sometimes the, the patient can fall to the cracks, unfortunately. Um, and that, that actually is one of the best examples that I have of how certain relationships and quality of their relationship impacts um, the clinical outcomes, especially in medical education. Um, or if you, they have no option than to come with you, but you don't have a good empathetic mentorship, coaching relationship with that resident, the resident will try to spend the least amount of time with you telling you the less details so you don't question him or her. And then the one that might be paying the price will be the um, the patient. So, you know, that's another example that I can, that I can come with. Isra, you are muted. Like on the bottom of the screen, on the left side corner, you will see the video and audio button. Sorry. This is this is getting a little okay. Thank you, uh, amazing. Thank you so much for those examples, Natalia. So that really, really kind of highlights. You know, just don't fall into contention. Try to get up to coexistence, even if it's even if it's um, you know feels a little awkward. Contention is where you don't want to talk to them. Coexistence is where you agree to disagree for the sake of your patient and the communities that you serve. Um, but try not to fall into contention. And so I want to kind of quickly kind of move into the second piece here of um, leading and belonging to a team. Now, this pyramid is the basis of a very well-known book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. I'd recommend that you all read it. It's a very short book. But this is essentially five dysfunctions that happen on a team that cause issues. OK, dysfunctions. The very first thing is, for a team that dysfunct that is dysfunctional is the absence of trust. What that basically means is that we're not willing to show that we've made a mistake. OK, we're not willing to show that we're vulnerable to our mistakes. Right. So last last uh, webinar, we talked about admitting that we don't know something. If we have a hard time doing that in front of a team. That means that there's not a lot of trust, okay? The other piece is fear of conflict, okay? So if there's artificial harmony and there's a lot of tension, that can also be a quick uh, derailer in terms of a team. Lack of commitment. So if people are not really understanding what they're responsible for, especially if you're in a practice that has multiple roles, so um, a physician and attending, interns, residents, medical assistants, registration, right? I'm working with a team right now at this very moment that has a lot of ambiguity and no one really knows what they're doing. So it's causing a lot of fracture. Having low standards, status, and ego, these are all pieces here that contribute to the dysfunctions of a team. So I would definitely recommend that you take a look at that book because this is sort of like the cornerstone of uh, team development. So let me go into my last tool that I'd like to share with you. And this is basically how do you resolve conflict when you are in a conflict zone, when you have a potentially contagious, uh, contagious, contentious uh, interaction with someone, how do you resolve it? Okay. And I've done this for many years and I've done this with you know, with, with people all over a hospital system, regardless of roles, nursing, leadership, um, you know, surgeons, uh, family physicians, it all works. If they, if they practice these four steps, it will work. Okay, conflict will, will be easier. So if you'll notice, these are the four steps to conflict resolution. And again, these are absolute basics. Um, we have a list of further reading that uh, we'd encourage you to take as we move forward. So the first thing you have to do, right, is to get your head right before you open your mouth in a conflict. 
what that basically means is going back to last webinar, okay? The last webinar was social awareness and self-awareness. What are your cortisol levels? What are your adrenaline levels? What's going on? You know, kind of get the stress response under control and clarify your motives for feeling hurt or feeling angry or, or feeling like there's a conflict. What do you really want? Do you want what's right for the patient? Do you want to win an argument? Do you want to show that you're right? Right, clarify what it is that you really want. Really get your head right. Take some time, talk to people that you trust, talk to your mentors to how to see clearly in this uh, contentious situation. Number two is master the ugly stories that you're telling yourself about someone. That basically means really check your own assumptions. We start assuming things about people um, and they become stories in our head and they're not really based on fact anymore. So if someone acts a certain way, right, it's, it's, we automatically assign meaning to that where we don't know the entire story. Um, just the other day, I had someone tell me, oh, Dr. So-and-so was rude to me. Okay, what did he do that made it that he was rude, right? So that's a story separated from what exactly happened. What's the fact? And you have to do that on your own as a leader. Separate the stories, the meaning, the interpretation from the actual facts. It's very difficult to do. So that needs a lot of practice. When you approach someone in a conflict situation, you must clarify your intention. You absolutely have to clarify your intention so that you're starting off with mutual purpose. What that may sound like is my intention for this conversation is to check, you know, uh, to make sure that we're on the same page for this particular patient, right? Or for this particular issue. I, you know, I'm assuming one thing. I just want to check for understanding. This is my intention, right? Just like that. No high voices, no, you know, no stress, nothing like that, because you have to get step one done right. Okay. And then the last piece here, and it is so often overlooked, is gaining commitment at the end of a conversation to really understand what are we going to do differently this time around together in order to not encounter this misstep, miscommunication, misunderstanding again. Commitment is so important. Don't just be satisfied with a good conversation. You must end every conflict resolution conversation with a commitment. Okay, moving forward, I will do this differently. What are you going to do? Okay, I will do this differently. Doing step four is so important because it prevents us from getting into the spiral, right? The spiral of, I talk to them and it's still happening. I talk to them, the problem is still happening. You're able to cut through this pattern by doing step four gaining commitment, okay? So as we move forward, I wanna give you some tips for practice. So number one is, like we said, observe the development levels on your team. Are they developed or are they developing? Are they in D1, D2, D3, D4, right? Are they new, are they enthusiastic? Can they do this on their own? Really understand that. Number two, I would recommend that you pay attention to what triggers the story that you tell yourself. What are your own assumptions that are not based on facts? Just start paying attention to that, okay? And start getting into the habit of asking, what do I really want? Because this goes back to getting your head right into these four steps of conflict resolution. And I've also included some bits of further reading here but at this point, I've really shared all the, the tools and, and the, the high level, um, you know, kind of critical pieces that I'd like for you to learn. Um, but I'd really like to invite um, Dr. Raman to is share some of his expertise, his journey, um, and his um, mentorship and guidance as it relates uh, to, this, to this topic. Yeah, maybe I'll just reintroduce Dr. Raman. Yes, Kinley, please do so. Yeah, Dr. Raman, just give me one minute. Uh, yeah, Dr. Raman Kumar is a past president for Wonka South Asia 2018 to 2021. And he, is, he was the first uh, chair for the 
uh, YDM, that is the Young Doctors Movement Chair in the South Asia. And, and he's also the founding president for the Academy of Family Physician India and chief and editor for Journal of Family Medicine and Primary Care. He has published more than 100 research, research papers. He continues to inspire and motivate young doctors in India and worldwide. Welcome, uh, Dr. Raman Kumar. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Kinley, Isra. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for inviting me here, Dr. Omar, uh, everyone part of this uh, workshop. Uh, I, I was very carefully listening to the workshop, to the technical uh, points that Isra was discussing, and all of us, uh, all of you have contributed. As leader, we have various you know, roles or expectations, or, or we have various perceptions about leadership, leadership roles. So from my experience, I would like to share some of you know, my own uh, uh, you know, experiences on how I see leadership, managerial roles and other such positions and how do we, you know, get get best out of it. Can I uh, share my slides, please? Because there is some slide there I cannot share my own. Yes, no problem. Thank you. So uh, you can see my slides now. Right, thank you very much. So uh, I, as I was introduced, uh, I wear many hats, uh, like many of us do in our positions. I am part of the National Board of Examinations, where I am a convener of the Family Medicine uh, Specialist. I am National President of Academy of Family Physicians of India. I part of a journal. I've been through the journey of Spice Root, Yonka Young Doctors Movements, Yonka South Asia. And also, I do my independent practice. So while I you know, talk to all of you, I have my patients waiting. Appointments are there after this talk. I'm also a full-time practicing physician. I'm a private practitioner. I'm a private family physician practicing full-time in community on my own. So I, I, I have some experience to share. And, and, and from that background, I'm coming to this workshop. Uh, what I've understood about leadership. Uh, so uh, this is uh, our group photograph of Bonka because I'll be talking mostly anchoring you know, this uh, entire discussion, uh, discussion about our own organization, World Organization of Family Doctors Bonka. And at that time, I was the uh, first uh, uh, chair of the Young Doctors Movement. And you can see people representing leaders, representing various regions of our world. We all you know, belong to different cultures, different continents, uh, you know, different age groups. And what we're all together for in Istanbul 2016 was the common purpose of Wonka. So commonality of purpose is one of the most important driving force of any organization or leadership you know, position or the purpose of leadership, I would say. So all people from different walks of life, different age groups, different genders, different, you know, uh, you know, academic backgrounds, experiences all come together for a purpose. And that is the purpose of leadership. And among these people, all of them are leaders. You know, we did have Professor Michael Kidd as our world president. But if you look around from the world, all of the people who are, you know, present in these photographs, our leaders still, you know, contribute to various organizations in different parts mm -hmm. of the in their own different capacities. So leadership is not about one person. You know, it is about the purpose. It is about the organization that you are working for, working with, or working or to build around. And as we all know, this you know concept of CanMed medical expert, and we are supposed to be as medical experts, scholars, advocates, managers, collaborators, professionals. And if you replace the word expert, it is actually you should be reading medical leaders or leaders, because these are all works of a leader in any organization, any system, any position, any time, whatever you do, you are supposed to be leaders. And this is, you know, also academically, you know, uh, uh, given upon us to be leaders. So it is not just a choice. Everybody, every medical professional has to be a leader, right? 
And when we are leaders and when we talk about the medical systems, we have to understand that we are not the, not the only one in the galaxy. And there are others, stakeholders. Uh, in this is in terms of you know business, but you know there are suppliers, employees, local communities, governments, non-government organizations. You know everything is part of what we are. So we have to be aware of where we are, who we are where we belong to and what the purpose of our organization, how do we fit in our you know, movement of our, you know, our, our, our uh, efforts in a direction that is not, you know, which is best in the momentum of the you know, overall scheme of the things. This is very, very important for the purpose. And from the perspective of family doctors, family medicine, something which we do is you know, not very common, which is whole person care. We all understand because everybody as community, as people, as systems, majority of the time understand is in terms of the organs, organ systems, uh, uh, spe specialties, you know, sub-specialties, not in terms of the whole person care. So this is something very unique with, with which we are always you know, challenged with, which we are promoting, which we are trying to advocate whole person care. So the purpose of what we do is you know, also about the philosophy, what we are trying to advance in our day-to-day -day practice, whether I'm practicing in my own clinic or when I'm you know, speaking on the Wonka Forum, it is same, whole person care. And also about the communities, because you know, one part is you know addressing our own you know colleagues, our own peers, uh, health system, and also the communities that we serve to, you know, what is their issues, what are their challenges, why they are confused, you know, what are the barriers uh, they are facing, and understanding ourselves and also outwardly you know the, the inner stakeholders and the, you know, externally we have to communicate and understand especially in relation to healthcare our patients communities and the population that we serve is very very important and you know i'm i'm, I'm bringing the symbols because you know this is how our medical education system looks at at human health and this is very important because you know uh, we all have heard about this story wise men and the elephant so doctors, physicians are supposed to be the wisest men, women, and still, you know, uh, we have, you know, differences of, you know, how we look at the human health. And this creates lots of conflicts within the health systems, problems and challenges within, in spite of being very advanced, very complicated, but still we have this problem of, you know, having a fragmented uh, overlook of the health system. And it is, it originates from our medical schools colleges how you know we are you know, taught you know in our test books how conventionally we are given the idea of healthcare and this, the, the thing of generalism is something that is not very valued in, in in medical system especially generalists are very very important in running governments bureaucrats politicians uh, you know spiritual leaders uh, journalists in judiciary or every year you see a journalist you know at the top notch of everything, but in the medical field, it is the specialist specialties. You know, the more narrow, the more specialized you are, the more valued person, more you know, you know, in terms of financials, you are rewarded. So the second thing that we want to emphasize to ourselves and to outward also to the community, society, is the importance of journalism. This is very very important for the purpose of it and the range of it. You know, depth we all know. Range is also very important. So whatever literature, one book I would recommend for all of you, Range, how journalists triumph in the specialized world. And specialists and journalists both are required. And this, uh, you know, symbolism, books, literature, uh, philosophies have to be imbibed, understood, and to be communicated wherever, you know, because these are the things which will bog you down many times, you know, which, which will inhibit you, which will make you smaller, inferior, many times, feel, even if, it is, if you're not. So you have to build up your argument from, you know, this background of scholaristic work. And of course, common sense of being you know, Swiss knife, you know, medical journalist is multi-skill. So we have to be using our common sense also is apart from the scholaristic, you know, academic work. And also communication is very, very important to show how specialists and journalists work in a system, any system, and this graphic is true for anyone, you know, any system, not just for health system, whether it's business, politics, governance, you know, everywhere this works, and 
you cannot compare journalists with the specialists. Normally, what we tend to say, you know, who is better, who is inferior, who is superior in that sense. But this is not so. And every system needs specialists, very, very specialized people, you know, people who know rocket science, also people who manage those rocket scientists. So this is very important that we understand and communicate in easy way so that everybody understands the importance of journalists in terms of family medicine, family practice, family physicians. And also another myth that specialists are more knowledgeable, intelligent. This is not true. A, a genius can only be a generalist. You know, through history, if you look at Mahatma Gandhi, Leila da Vinci, Ravindranath Tagore, all have, you know, to say that, you know, must check of all, must have none. It's not, you know, something. But this is the whole idea for philosophy of family practice, general practice, generalism. And, you know, this is the level you can reach and uh, reach. And this is in the level of stimulation, intellectual stimulation that you can, you know, feel when you work in this field and not feel low about what you do. And like you see in this example, painter, sculptor, architect, musician, mathematician, engineer, inventor, you know, whatnot, everything. He designed the parachutes, tanks, aeroplanes at his times, 15th, 16th century, five centuries back. So you can just imagine, you know, the purpose or, you know, dynamics of being a genius. And only a journalist can be a genius, a specialist can only perform good procedures, specialized procedures. And we often talk about leadership and management. You know, we look at leaders as, you know, someone superiors or managers who are, you know, often toxic in, in that term. And this is the discussion in the corporate world normally, you know, and what are the, you know, difference between a leader and a manager. And manager is often looked down as, you know, someone who is, you know, hard taskmaster, you know, uh, who is something, you know, uh, not to be with around, who is, you know, very bad to be, you know, work with. Something like that, but leisure is something you know. Who is you know, uh, uh, you know, like a deity. Uh, we all pray and you know look up to, and uh, you know, so so nice and so big people. But if you carefully look at this graphic, leaders are very big as compared to their followers. And management, you know, it's kind of you know. So in this context, it's important that you know when whatever you are, you know, leader or manager, you have to be firm as well as flexible because one of the purpose of you know the two types of you know activities one is running the organization for which you have to be firm you know you cannot be just flexible and you know make happy everyone kind of person when we are in a leadership position so you have to be firm and you also have to be flexible as a leader because you know we have to listen to the other people requirement needs aspiration objectives and as intelligent beings Human beings are supposed to be intelligent, most intelligent among the, you know, all planetary animals or, uh, you know, living beings. But as AI is taking over, we have to be intelligent, ever evolving by training, experience, network, peer, whatever, you know. Intelligent is one who keeps on learning. So this is very, very important. It is not about your qualification and we are from Harvard or, you know, very high position. If you stop learning, you become, you know, less intelligent out of, you know, context. And mentorship is very, very important, whether you're a leader, manager, and one who aspires to be leader has to be ready to be, you know, mentored, you know, mentee. You cannot be a leader without being a mentee because you have to, you know, learn from people. If you are egocentric, you do not want to take ideas from others, then you cannot be a leader. And in terms of running organizations, like, for example, Gonka, you need continuity. We want productivity. We have to have outcomes. Uh, we also need to have growth and transformation. So many times, both the roles of leaders and managers are combined. They are not separate. Any leader, and, and this you would find interesting, that leader minus manager is a poet. So... <laughs> You can do poetry, say good things, uh, you know, very popular. You can be taught in textbook, but you cannot be a transformative leader without being a good manager. So you have to be both. So always remember this mind and leadership is not about doing big, big things. It is not about being Martin Luther King or John F. Kennedy. 
It is also about doing your day-to-day -day work in your family, in your office, in your neighborhood. It is also the leadership. And simultaneously, it is also manager's role or any worker's role because you are also a citizen of your country, of this planet. And this is the best part of any leadership uh, process where you cannot identify the leader because it is a commonality, as I said in the beginning, of the goal of the purpose, which brings the purpose of leadership is very, very important. You cannot identify a leader in a leadership process. This is the best ideal situation. Um, I would not go into details, but you know, uh, for transformative leaders, you know, this is a very good book for entrepreneurs. This is also very good for leadership because there are things that we do conventionally. We move on horizontal line and we finish our lifespan. This is the concept from this book, Zero to One. But for leadership, for entrepreneurship, you have to do unconventional things. Like in today's specialized world, being a family physician, generalist, general practitioner, it is an unconventional thing. And here lies your, you know, opportunity to create, uh, you know, something new, something big, something bigger than what it was. It is not a conventional life that you have chosen. And you have the courage to do, to pursue, to create the leverage of, you know, what, you know, a, a person, an unconventional person would do. And this is what most leaders have this quality, to do something unconventional. And it is zero to one. It is not zero to ten, zero to hundred. You just have to be slightly, you know, lift off from your conventional thinking lifestyle. So for leadership, to summarize, you know, you have to have a vision. And any person who aspires to be leader, there are two most important things. Number one, to my experience, is initiative, taking initiatives and taking responsibility. So many times, as I said, poets may have vision. But leader is one who takes initiative and responsibility. Then comes the goals. Then you need to have a program for your team. Then the teams come in because they buy in this vision. And then, the, you know, in this hierarchy, skills, competences, resources, capacity, support, network, and organization, leadership, all this come. But initiative and responsibility are the most important part of it. You know, team comes next. I have a few more slides. Just so these are the common things that bring people together. You know, common threats, common incentives, higher order of societal objectives, employment of you know occupation. You know, this is one of the reasons: ideologies, political ideologies, you know, communal religious ideologies, and common purpose should be communicated, written, and oral both. And then it comes to you know, building of a team and also organization. Often you know, there is conflict, but then again, I come back to the same, you know, the commonality of the purpose. And in our case, it is the power of purpose, which is, you know, Wonka. And Wonka defines in terms of, you look at the vision, mission, objectives of Wonka. And that is why we are here. So once you are for that, you bring our best, you bring best of our skills, uh, competencies, for the benefit of our common objective on this platform. So power of purpose is very, very important for, you know, for any kind of, you know, uh, conflict resolution. And this is how people from different backgrounds, different countries, different nationalities, different languages come together, work together for the success of purpose, not for a leader. It is about the purpose and the goal. Thank you very much. So, these are my thoughts and experiences. I would like to hear more from all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Raman, for sharing your insightful, uh, of all your experiences of leadership from a very young age until now. I'm sure that every one of us has something to take from this, such an insightful presentation. You made it up there. Uh, anything you want to say, Ezra? Yeah. So, um, oh no, I I just uh, have uh, such uh, such respect and such admiration for what was uh, shared. So, um, I want to open it up to um, anyone. Does have have any questions or anything that they would like to share in the chat, um, specifically for Dr. Raman uh, or uh, anything that we've shared so far.
Natalia. Yes. Yes. Hi. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, it was so inspiring. Um, and I just want to touch base on um, something that was said last about that, that when you're a leader, it's about the success of the purpose, not about the success of the leader. I think that's so inspiring and such a way to lead. Um, and that's actually how you, that's how you keep um, your team inspired, right? That's how you keep them going. That's why you have to have a clear vision and mission of your purpose of your organization, because how that's how you're going to get people to buy in. If they, if they don't believe in the mission, if they don't believe in the vision, they're not going to manage up. They're not going to follow. They're, they're just not going to engage. So I think that was so important. Thank you. It was, it was really good. Do we have any questions for our leaders here? Anyone from the audience? Okay, I uh, I think uh, I don't see any other hands raised. Um, so I'll go. Um, oh, did I see something in the chat? Um, no. Okay, so I'll just go ahead and and begin to wrap up here. Um, we'd like to um thank everyone, especially Dr. Roman, for such an inspiring and and um such a really holistic um view of leadership as it relates to your experience and, and your journey so far so uh, we continue to be very very thankful and grateful for your presence here and what you've shared um and so i just want to give everyone just a, a an overview of our next session session three uh is going to be at the end of september and we're going to be really shifting gears and talking about self-care and how to maintain your effective leadership practices so recovering, preventing burnout, um, tools for prevention, recovering from burnout, as well as resilience. So that is uh, an overview of what we will be talking about next time. Uh, Kinley, please um, take things over to wrap us up and uh, for next steps. Yes. Thank you very much, everyone, all the audience for joining us today and my speakers and Dr. Rahman for uh, for your insightful presentation. Yes, as Ezra mentioned, uh, kindly join join us on the same time on 30th of September. On the top, the uh, topic we are going to present that time is uh, maintenance made easier. Yeah, details already shared by Ezra. Hi. So yeah. Anyone sharing? My anything? phone just. Okay. So um yeah uh. We do feel free to um, drop any questions, anything if you have. Otherwise, uh, we are going to wrap up. Wrap up now. Uh, we have a questionnaire that we will email to you. Kindly fill that up, and yeah, see you all in the next session. Thank you all very much. A good, have a good day and a good night.